Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, July 6, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, how well-founded was the weekend's terror alert? Then, Greece says no to bailout debt. And if anything goes wrong, blame Rand Paul. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm just sick of dishonorable trash. I'm sick of people enjoying selling people out and preying on people. Let me tell you what I'm really tired of. I'm tired of the good men out there doing nothing. As we pointed out last week, for an entire week, the mainstream media has been pushing a narrative of fear, of conspiracies by terrorists. Yet this week, after nothing happened, are they facing any criticism whatsoever? Has the conservative media, especially the GOP, have they jumped the shark along with the FBI and Homeland Security in terms of pushing this? Of course, we've got Christie this week, yesterday, at the very end of the weekend, criticizing Rand Paul, blaming him for terrorism that A, didn't happen this weekend, and B, he says, might happen in the future. Remember, this is the same guy that wants to lock up Snowden for what he revealed about criminal activities about our government. He says, what Rand Paul has done is to make the country weaker and more vulnerable is a terrible thing, said Christie. As the only guy who used the Patriot Act in this race as a former prosecutor, we're going to look back on this, and he should be in front of hearings, in front of Congress. If there's another attack, not the director of the FBI or the director of the CIA. No, they're only the people who violated the Constitution, who violated their oath to uphold the Constitution, who have violated so many different aspects of the rule of law, continually scaring us this last week. Look at, of course, let's go back and look at some of these headlines. We had Peter King, congressman, going on Fox News with Megyn Kelly, talking about a dirty bomb. He certainly expected a dirty bomb in New York. And, of course, Megyn Kelly played along with all that, says, really? Really? Tell us about that. And then we had the FBI going on, telling us that, we were going, they were going to have to establish command centers across the United States just to deal with this ISIS threat. Now, of course, that was the conservative press. That was Fox News. The mainstream media, uh, CNN, and of course, ABC, NBC, CBS, the old guard, they were telling us just the opposite. They weren't really concerned at all about terrorism. They were far more concerned about the Confederate flag. This article today on InfoWars from Steve Watson, mainstream media devotes five times more time to Confederate flag flap than to the ISIS threat. And he asks, what's more important, the Dukes of Hazard or U.S. citizens who are joining ISIS? He says, analysis by the Media Research Center shows the big three U.S. networks devoted at least twice as much airtime during their main evening news shows to outrage over the Confederate flag than they did to the news that several American citizens have recently been recruited by ISIS, the terrorist group. Now, they point out that all of this happened in just five days in just the last week, whereas, of course, the ISIS uh, stuff has been going on for the entire month. So they say when you look at the numbers that they've got there, it's actually five times as large. Let's take a look at some of the critiques that uh, Chris Christie was leveling at Rand Paul. And remember, this came on the very last day of the 4th of July weekend after none of their predictions of violence came true. No dirty bombs, no beheadings. How do we defeat ISIS? Uh, arm, our al <laughs> arm our allies, train them, and it's their fight. Let them fight it over there with our support, our help, our arms, um, and our training. What Rand Paul has done to make this country weaker and more vulnerable is a terrible thing. And for him to raise money off of it is disgraceful. What he's done is we're going to look back on this. I w listen this morning. We're going to look back on this. And he should be in front of hearings in front of Congress if there's another attack, not the director of the FBI or the director of the CIA. Joining me now is Joe Biggs. And I wanted to get Joe in. Uh, Joe, I wanted you to talk about Jade Helm. Because one of the things I look at when I see this last weekend, I, I see them jumping the shark in the media, and yet nobody is holding them accountable to it. We know this is what's going to happen with Jade Helm. We know that there's a lot of people who have said this is going to usher in martial law. I think we should always be vigilant. I have a lot of concerns. We still... Uh, remain concerned about Jade Helm. It's starting in about uh, well, less than two weeks now. In nine days. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I'm very concerned about what it represents, the training that it represents, the uh, special forces being used as boots on the ground for the surveillance state, which is what I believe that it's about. I believe that if they had something other than just an exercise, they'd be foolish to do it at this point. They'd be wiser to do it at a later date. But when that doesn't happen, are we going to see the kind of pushback 
uh, against uh, alternate, alternative media that uh, we have not seen against mainstream media? <laughs> you see, that's the funny thing. We're going to take a lot of flack. I, I, I guarantee yeah. you, come September 15th, the day that this is over, you're going to hear people going, oh, these guys are just fear-mongering. Meanwhile, like you said, the great point you just brought up, these other news sources, Fox News, CNN, hammer in the fact that ISIS is just getting ready to attack on the 4th of July. Fear, fear, fear. Don't go out. You don't, maybe you shouldn't go out and barbecue. Maybe you shouldn't go out, you know, and yeah. they're ramping this up. But meanwhile, like you said, no one is going, well, you know what? Nothing happened. I'd be very surprised. I said a, a week, uh, a week ago, I said, I'd be very surprised if we aren't talking about a massive terrorist attack. We had Peter King, the dirty bomb. That's what this is all about. And Megyn Kelly, really? The dirty bomb? Tell us more about it. I mean, yeah, tell us about it because it's the Republicans, the Republican politicians that are getting their base stirred up about ISIS who have been over there creating ISIS. It was Senator McCain who went over there. They, they equipped them, they fund them, they train them as their tool against Syria to bring them down, going into Iran, to, into Iraq, creating havoc to scare everyone. But also it's, it's a real force that they have created. And yet when they make these outlandish predictions this last week, from all branches of the government as well as the media. Nobody holds them accountable here on Monday morning. Exactly. I mean, that's mind-blowing to see how that happens with them. But when we talk about something we're concerned and we can bring proof and documents and sit down and discuss why, as a country, why, as a state of Texas, we are worried about this upcoming exercise, mm -hmm. we immediately become bashed for bringing it up, for talking about it, for opening a dialogue, and then even trying to go out and ask Fox and all these other places, hey, come have Alex on. He'll talk about it. We'll do this and that. And they skate around and they, you know, they duck and dodge the entire thing. But we've got it. It's coming up uh, July 15th through September 15th. And I want to encourage people, look, we have time and time again to get out there, film. If you know these exercises are going to be conducted in your uh, area of operation around your, the cities where you live, get a camera. Go out there for a couple of days. Talk to people. Find out what's going on. Send us some information and help us out. But, you we know. We still remain concerned about the militarization of the police. We still remain concerned about the fact that they want to use special forces to collect biometric data, that they want them to use, to use them as boots on the ground. We're concerned about geospatial uh, intelligence, where they're mapping out and profiling their opposition. And we're concerned about the unusual aspects that you pointed out, labeling real places as enemies and running this out for such a long time with all the special forces. I mean, they say right there in the documents, suspicious activity will be conducted. Yes. But meanwhile, they're going around at the, at the meetings in Bastrop going, oh, there's nothing going to be going on. There might be one or two Humvees or might be this and that. But they keep contradicting themselves. They keep getting caught in lies time and time again, which further fuels the distrust yeah. in this entire operation. So I can't blame everyday American, Joe, Jill, whoever, who sees this and goes, you know what, I, I kind of feel like I should question this because you're not giving us the truth. You keep backstepping, and then it's this and it's that, and it, it just doesn't add up. Yes, exactly. Let's take a look at some of the outrageous claims that were done by the mainstream media. we got a special report from John Bound breaking all of that down in more detail for us. These united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Speculative terror threats now routine in America. Every holiday serves as an advertisement for the war on terror industry. If you planned on traveling this 4th of July weekend, you may have encountered an increased number of special TSA agents and teams at large airline hubs. For more than a week, the federal government has warned of a terror attack over the holiday despite no credible threat beyond attacks in France, Tunisia, and Kuwait. Regardless, last Friday, the FBI and Department of Homeland Security issued a bulletin warning of attacks against law enforcement officers and the military. There is no specific credible intelligence to indicate any threats against celebrations over the 4th of July weekend, said a Homeland Security Department official. However, we have seen repeatedly calls for violence over the past year by leadership and supporters of ISIS against members of the military and military installations, law enforcement, the U.S. government, and the American public. These threats are always taken seriously, and we continue to work with state and local law enforcement to ensure their safety. 
The Washington Navy Yard false alarm or hoax on Thursday is being used by authorities to tell people to stay alert for possible ISIS terror over the weekend. It turned out to be a false alarm. Jay Johnson, the Homeland Security boss, said Americans must remain vigilant during Independence Day events and said security measures, including those unseen by the public, will be adjusted as necessary. So these kind of warnings go out routinely, um, but there's nothing routine about this particular one to me. This one really resonates with me for two reasons. One is there's been about 50 people in the last 12 months who've been arrested in the United States um, for being radicalized by ISIS, wanting to go fight there or wanting to conduct an attack here. So there's a lot of people out there who are seeing themselves as aligned with ISIS. The FBI has used the unverified threat of an attack to establish command centers around the United States. These command centers and so-called fusion centers are routinely used to monitor political activists, not supposed terrorists. The centers often work hand in hand with the private sector to undermine the First Amendment rights of American citizens. Largely baseless terror warnings timed to coincide with holidays are used to keep the terror narrative moving along and serves as an advertisement for the terror industry and the military industrial complex, now the military intelligence industrial complex. The corporate media realizes the fatuousness of endless and unfounded terror warnings and has endeavored to dispel growing criticism on the part of the American people. Perspective is important here, reports CNN. While they sound ominous, many of these warnings and precautions are also pretty routine. Any holiday weekend, and especially the 4th of July, is a ripe target for a terrorist attack since more civilians travel and there are large ceremonial gatherings. Who's the paranoid conspiracy theorist now, CNN? Despite the fact Al-Qaeda and now ISIS have singled out the United States as the primary target in a supposed war against the infidels, ISIS has called on its followers over social media uh, for attacks during the period of Ramadan, which we have a, a couple of weeks left of. So that's something you have to factor in. There has not been a single significant terror event in the U.S. since 9-11, nearly a decade and a half ago. Most of the supposed terror threats hyped by the establishment media are in fact patsy operations conducted by the FBI. CNN would have us believe otherwise. America is in a unique threat environment largely because of ISIS success as a global jihadist entity. Hi Atlanta, we're about to have a short course in missile identification. This is a Scud. You can tell it by its distinctive label. Now when the missile is launched, the first thing you look for is the plume sticking out behind it. Now when you detect this, you can tell it's been launched. The news agency, formerly a station for U.S. Army psychological <laughs> operations during the first Gulf invasion, <laughs> argues that it is a combination of good law enforcement work and luck that has spared the country. But that could change in a matter of days. Ah, liberty, liberty. Are you substance or merely shadow? Come, Dr. Rush, our liberty is won. The revolution is over. Not so. Not so, sir. There's nothing more common than to confuse the American Revolution with the war for independence. The war for independence is over. But this is far from being the case with the American Revolution. John Bound for Infowars.com. So with all the misdirection that we've been given about threats, about liberty this weekend, about real history. As a matter of fact, if you want some real history, look up what Lysander Spooner said about the Civil War, about slavery, about secession. He was an abolitionist. But nobody can speak better to the true ideals of liberty than somebody who has suffered under tyranny, under slavery. Someone like Frederick Douglass. And we have an article from Reason Magazine today saying, Frederick Douglass on liberty, slavery, and the 4th of July. And Reason points out that Frederick Douglass simultaneously championed both civil rights and economic liberty. And of course, what that's called is classical liberalism. It was called liberalism before the term was hijacked by some Marxists. They point out that he sought both racial equality and the right to enjoy the fruits of one's labor. Now, here's the, a quote from the letter that he wrote to his former slave master. He said, you are a man, so am I. I'm leaving you. I took nothing but what belonged to me and in no way lessened your means for obtaining an honest living. Escaping from slavery wasn't just an act of self-preservation. They say Douglas maintained that it was an affirmation of his unalienable natural rights. He says, your faculties remain yours and mine become useful to their rightful owner. 
And we need to understand that on this 4th of July, it's not the American people that seem to embody the spirit of liberty. It was the Greek people who said to the rent-seeking IMF and World Bank, we will not be your property. We will not be your slave. Stay with us. After the break, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to have John Rappaport talk to us about the coming medical tyranny, removing our informed consent. And in California, where that happened, the senator, Dr. Pan, one of his vol volunteers for seven years has now been debilitated by one of the vaccines that he took. We'll have video testimony of that as well. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, this weekend, it looks like the real heroes of liberty were in Greece. These people, in the spirit of Thermopylae, stood up to the banksters and said, Molan Labe, to the money changers who wanted to take over their country. Take a look at this cartoon. I think it says a lot. You see animals with flags of every one of the European nations running over a cliff called austerity, except for one. That one is wearing the flag of Greece. It's running away from the cliff. But of course, those who are running over it say, there's always one idiot. No, they're not. They knew exactly what they're doing. Greece votes no. The European Union is dying before our eyes. This is an op-ed piece from Nigel Farage, who has made a, a very good career out of the UK Independence Party opposing the European Union and its technocratic dictatorship, which is what they were trying to impose upon Greece. This is what he had to say. He said, despite the scaremongering and the bullying from those in Brussels, we are waking today with Greece having delivered a resounding no. That comes despite EU bosses saying it would mean a Greek exit from the euro, not to mention the heavy economic pressure placed upon the Greek people to go along with the wishes of Brussels. It is a crushing defeat for those Eurocrats who believe that you can simply bulldoze public opinion. And he points out there's a bigger picture to consider, a demographic picture, he says. There's a huge generational dynamic existing in this, running through all this. He says, one poll from uh, an agency in Greece found that 67% of Greeks under the age of 35 voted no, which shows just how much the seismic plates are shifting within European politics. But then he talks about how the result is a tired, stumbling European Union that is dying on its feet before your very eyes. Will it, however, be replaced by some larger economic union, the TTIP, perhaps, the Transatlantic Investment Partnership? Remember last week, uh, as this was running up, the USA Today opinion, the op-ed piece, said, uh, we think that Greece should say no. They should go their own way. They should be their own people. But they had a very interesting sentence that I think stood out amongst the rest. They didn't really go into it in a lot of detail, but they said the answer lies in the peculiar collection of nations known as the Eurozone. These countries share a monetary system, but not a political one, which is a recipe for trouble. You see, you cannot, and the, the core truth of this, that they really didn't explore because they don't want to get into how the Trans-Pacific and the Transatlantic partnerships are fundamentally about our sovereignty as was the European Union. And I should say is, because it is far from finished, but there are a lot of people who are pushing to get out of it. It's fundamentally not just an economic union. Remember that the EU began as a trade agreement and then progressed on to something that was far more tightly integrated than to a financial currency. They're now using this economic crisis to try to push them into a political union where they devolve sovereignty, where they give it up to Brussels, to the European Union. That has always been the design from the very beginning. They're not using a crisis. They're creating this crisis. This was the design from the very beginning. And nationalist groups like UKIP, like uh, Le Pen's uh, party in France, many people are starting to see this design and many people are waking up, especially generationally. Typical of the way the Greek people have been represented in the press, especially the British press. They're called big, fat, lazy references to the big, fat Greek wedding. Here's this one from The Telegraph. They say the Greek government's monthly salary and pensions bill is the equivalent of buying 548 Bugatti Veyrons every month. Guess what? The Greek people aren't getting Bugatti Veyrons every month. We're talking about pensioners who are having their promises broken, that were given promises through their working life. You know who's buying the Bugatti Veyrons, of course, that's Goldman Sachs. Look at this article today on Infowars.com. The Troika swindle. Greeks owe nothing. 245 billion euros of the debt was fraudulently dumped on the country. He points out, and remember it was just a couple of weeks ago, that the uh, committee in uh, Greece said that this debt is illegal, illegitimate, and odious. And that's a particular legal phrase, odious, meaning that it was not legitimate. 
They point out that this was dumped on them as a result of the financial bailouts of banks in Europe. The debt was taken by the sovereign countries in Europe, and 245 of the 323 billion euro debt is debt owed to the banks. That was bailed out of the banks. So they give that money to the banks to keep them uh, uh, floating. And then what they say is, oh, now it looks like you've got too much on your balance sheet. So we're going to have to uh, raise your interest rates. They're saying you've got 180% debt to GDP ratio. No, actually, if you look at this, they really only have 78% actual debt to GDP ratio. Remember this committee a couple of weeks ago in Greece said that the debt was illegal, illegitimate, and odious. Why is it illegitimate and odious? Because it was fraudulently dumped on the Greek people. $245 billion out of the $323 billion. In other words, 76% of the debt was given to banks. And of course, that money did not stay in Greece. It went to J.P. Morgan Chase. It went to HSBC. And of course, one of the biggest beneficiaries, Goldman Sachs. Now they say, your credit rating is lower. You need to pay a higher interest rate. You need to pay this back. And we're going to cut off your cash. The Greek people said, we're not taking this anymore. They said resoundingly, no. What would the people of America do? Leanne McAdoo went to the streets of Austin and asked the people, of course, we know that Americans are exceptional. Nothing bad like this can ever happen in America. But what if it did? This is what they had to say. What do you think about what's going on in Greece? Do you think something like that could happen here? Well, of course, it's happening in Puerto Rico. That's kind of here. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, especially with the IMF, the way they handle things, uh, I think it's, it's, it's very possible. How would you feel if the banks were shut down here for a week and they, you could only take out about $60 a day? I think most people would be panicked. I would try to plan for something like that, but I've, I think a lot of people would panic. I'd be pissed off. That is a very good question. What would we all do? How would your business survive or thrive if people weren't able to get cash out of the bank? Well, I personally think that it's a real tragedy that you would have a country that would go bankrupt that once had money and now don't have any money. But a business like mine would, would, uh, would just die there. And bless our heart, we're, we're, we're a generous people and we want to make sure that our citizens are happy. But there's a warning out there someplace that, you know, there is a limit on how much money you can borrow and still pay it back on time. And as far as I know, you can't borrow money without paying interest on it. Yeah. Well, unless you're a bank. They're going to start looking at ways to kind of pay the banks, keep them solvent, which will be taking 30%, a little haircut out of people's savings accounts. Anyone who has about 8,000 euros in their account. Should be okay giving a little haircut to the banks? Uh, it doesn't sound right, because that's the money that I've saved. I don't have a savings account. I, I keep my money at home. Would you be okay pushing back your retirement so that the banks could get paid, even though it was the banks that were doing the risky trading and everything? I wouldn't have a whole lot to give, but um, <laughs> you know, whatever they but take, that, I wouldn't so be mine. very cool about it. Yeah, exactly. They may need to take some austerity measures, which ones and at what level, it's way beyond me to know. Do you think that the Greek people are just greedy because they're just addicted to all this welfare that's been coming their way? Or do you think it's the banks that are being greedy? Well, if the Greek people are countries who are controlled, I call it aristocracy, not a democracy, that's owned by the bank. So they don't really have any options. I don't know that much about it, but I know if you're borrowing money, you ought to pay it back. Do you give uh, one of our 50 states a credit card and they default on it so the rest of the states have to suffer it? I think we should leave them on their own. They've been spending recklessly for years and now it's, uh, it's got them. I tend to err on the side of kindness and let's help a brother out, but <laughs> this is not the first time they've been in this situation either. It wasn't actually the Greeks Who taken. Who borrowed the money and who got the benefit of the borrowed money? It's the people with the pension, this, the government employees, all benefited from that borrowed money. That's how they got paid what they got. That's how they got the pensions they got. And so they are the benefactors of the borrowed money. A bailout might bring restrictions that they don't want. It's gonna be back in the same position they were. But on the other hand, if it causes the entire world stage to start to fall, yeah. <laughs> is it, is it best for them? 
Maybe not. The government borrowed the money on their behalf. They were the beneficiaries. You can't borrow money and get all the advantage of that borrowed money and not pay it back. So you telling me that you can make me hungry, but the government is okay because they own the company. Well, that's not right. Yeah. That's communism. They do not get a free lunch. I couldn't figure out how they would allow themselves to go bankrupt because they will go broke. And usually they're too greedy to go broke, but I can go broke if somebody else is paying for it. There will be some pain involved. Now, coming up, we have testimony from a man who's just been debilitated by a vaccine. But first, joining us now is John Rappaport of NoMoreFakeNews.com. Of course, he has pointed out where these mandatory vaccines are going. It's not just something that is targeted at school children. This is targeted at adults as well. And as a reminder, we just had a uh, story that went up this last weekend about a volunteer for the pro-SB277 senator. That's the bill in California that would mandate vaccines for school children without exemption. That senator, Dr. Pan, uh, this, this fellow was a volunteer for him, and he's now been hospitalized after a vaccine, after the Tdap vaccine. He has now apparently come down with Guillain-Barre syndrome, and uh, that's something that we've seen before. I want to talk to John Rappaport because, John, um, we had an article of yours that we carried uh, just a couple of months ago back in February Adult immunization push, this is a coming medical dictatorship. Talk to us about that. Okay. The National Adult Immunization Plan, that's what it's being called. Mm -hmm. And people have to understand that, as I warned a long time ago, this would be tied into Obamacare, which is the plan. In other words, this is now a rider on that law. Yes. To get all adults in the United States vaccinated and caught up, quote, on all previous vaccines. So you could find yourself under this law, if it passes, receiving 40, 50, 60 shots in order to catch up with the vaccines that you never got. And the toxic load would be extraordinary. I mean, uh, in my estimation, this would provoke an all-out rebellion in the country. Absolutely. No question about it. And, and, of course, we see this coming because if they're going to assume all of your health care costs, they're now going to treat you as a dependent on the state. And they're going exactly. to dictate what medical treatment you can have, what medical treatment you cannot have. Because, of course, that's the flip side of this, isn't it, John? That not only will they force things on you, but they will withhold things for you that you believe are safe and effective. They won't allow you to have those. Absolutely. And dependence, as you say, is the key. Because they say, okay, look, you now have the largesse of the federal government. We're giving you insurance. Uh, therefore, you have to go along with what we, we want. Yeah. Because we, we have to protect you. And this is the standard of good care, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting to note who the so-called stakeholders are in this. They love to use that word. Yeah, because we don't we don't have any stake in this because we don't own anything. We're just the peasants, <laughs> yeah, the slaves. Right. We're the livestock, exactly. the inventory of these people. They do whatever they wish because they hold all the cards, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> yeah, we are not the stakeholders. That's right. Uh, the stakeholders are the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the White House, because and the Congress because they passed Obamacare. Uh, this plan was originally vetted by the RAND Corporation, the infamous RAND Corporation, the adult immunization plan. The pharmaceutical companies, of course, are stakeholders here because they're going to profit enormously, and they yeah. always knew they would. I mean, this is not just some new idea that floated in here, adult vaccination. Oh, yeah. This was, you know, in the works for a very long time. Just look at the fact so, that they gave them legal immunity back in 1986 under Reagan. They said, you're not going to be held responsible for any harm your products do. I mean, nobody else gets that kind of legal protection that the pharmaceutical companies have. And just today, we covered earlier in the news the fact that it's only been about a week or so since the Supreme Court said that they're going to assume the difference in what people can pay and what the Cadillac insurance policies cost. And they're going to put that on the taxpayers back. And then immediately, we start seeing across the country 
uh, insurance increases from 25 to over 50 percent on insurance policies over the already large increases that many people experienced when this began to roll out. Exactly. And that was another part. The health, the big health insurance companies always knew that they would make money off of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. That's why they went along with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these vaccines, as I've written about so many times, are incredibly toxic. We're talking about toxic chemicals like formaldehyde and, and uh, metals like aluminum, polysorbate 80, and so forth, injected directly into the body. Yes. And of course, we're talking about many germs, not just the germs they intend to put in the vaccines that get in there during the manufacturing process. The vaccine manufacturers have admitted on the record that they can't guarantee that all of these uh, lots of vaccines are safe. Mm -hmm. They just can't do it. Well, so, we already saw well, this massive amount of Guillain-Barre syndrome back in the swine flu debacle where they panicked everybody into uh, getting swine flu back in 1976. And they gave them, at that time, they said, well, we're going to get your informed consent. Now they long, no longer even care about that. But they gave them an insert that was about a completely different vaccine. And then we had a lot of people that, that got sick from that. Yeah, I think 523 people died. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, stopped all of a sudden. It was just cast aside like it never happened because the whole thing was crazy. Mm -hmm. These people weren't really suffering from swine flu the people who died. So the vaccine, as dangerous as it was, was totally irrelevant in the first place. And then people started dropping like flies from the vaccine. And then they stopped the whole program. Absolutely. So this is the kind of insanity that you can expect. And as I say, this will provoke a national rebellion if they pass a law like this requiring all adults to be immunized. This is an attempt to create synthetic immune systems in every human mm -hmm. and to deny that there's any such thing as a natural immune system in a human being. This is saying, I mean, this is technocracy. This is transhumanism. This is that whole agenda, except that people don't really recognize that it's taking place in this area. This Absolutely. is saying, look, we don't put any stock in the fact that you have a natural immune system or that you can improve the strength of this immune system through nutrition, through healthy living, through any of that, through good family life at home, et cetera, et cetera. No, that has nothing to do with anything. We are going to create a synthetic immune system for you from birth all the way through to death, and that's going to be the vaccines. That's what that is. Well, this is not science. This is destruction. This is eugenics. This is part of the eugenics program. And as I wrote recently, the newest vaccines under research, in fact, are not vaccines at all. They are synthetic genes, and they're being tested now, to be inserted into viruses, which are then injected into the body, mm -hmm. that supposedly produce antibodies against uh, protection against these diseases, but also, in fact, permanently change the genetic structure of the humans into which they are injected. So we're now talking about total, exactly, you've got the article up there. Yeah. California is ordering genetic alteration. That's what the future is holding here. That is so what's so they scary pass to me. This law, that's what's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's very scary. And people should be aware that it's coming down the pipeline and they should do everything possible to resist and to protect their freedom. Absolutely, because they're making every new treatment, John, as you well know, a vaccine because they have legal immunity in case their product does any harm. So they are every new treatment is, is coming out and they're calling it a vaccine. Then it's uh, given protection under the vaccine court. And of course, in terms of looking at risk, that's part of being informed. And as we pointed out before, uh, going back about a decade, there was, I think, about 100 people who had died from measles vaccines, yet no one had died from measles. We just had the first death in 12 years of somebody from measles complications, but that's the issue and that's the risk. You know, we, both of these situations are very rare. Somebody dying from measles, somebody dying from a measles vaccine, yet the one that is far more rare by 100 to one is dying from the actual disease measles. It's 100 times 
more likely that you're going to die from the vaccine or perhaps get some horrific side effects like this uh, fellow that we had the article about I mentioned at the beginning of the interview uh, who contracted Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, because of a uh, Tdap vaccine that he had. Yeah, that's right. And in addition to that is the fact that the, the system for reporting serious, what they call adverse events from vaccines, is totally broken in the United States. Absolutely. So they're, when they claim and they crow that these adverse effects are extremely rare, et cetera, et cetera, they're lying through their teeth because they have no reliable statistics. Sorry, we're out of time, John. Thank you so okay. much for joining us. Uh, that's uh, John Rappaport, no more fake news. Dot com. Thank you so much for pointing that out. We have to be careful about the risk that they're bringing to us with these uh, new and novel treatments, as well as the medical tyranny that they're ushering in. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, David. Now, stay with us. After the break, we're going to have testimony from that man who has been harmed by vaccines, a man who worked seven years as a volunteer for the California doctor who pushed the mandatory vaccine bill through. Stay with us. We'll be right back. You know, it's important to put a human face on suffering, especially when it's suffering from adverse reactions due to vaccinations, as we look at our informed consent being removed. People who have these adverse reactions are marginalized, they're minimized, they have their rights to sue for compensation from Big Pharma taken away. We've got a video that we want to play for you that premiered this last weekend on InfoWars. It was done by Telly Blackwood in California. And it shows the suffering of one adult man. And we need to keep this in mind that this is not something that they're doing just for children. It's not something that's just MMR vaccines or even the vaccines that are with us today. This is going to be for any vaccines that Big Pharma wants to produce in the future and put on the schedule. And as an added irony, this man who is suffering, who has had his life forever altered, was a seven-year volunteer for the very senator who successfully rammed through the bill in California that would take away Californians' rights of informed consent. Well, this is an interesting thing that uh, this vaccination is what caused my uh, illness or syndrome or whatever it is. I was a perfectly healthy person, and the only thing I did differently was get a vaccination recommended by my doctor. And now that I have this disease or syndrome or whatever the heck it is, this paralysis, this inability to have any quality of life, it's hard not to think about the decisions of the Governor Brown and Senator Richard Pan on the mandatory bill they signed into law requiring children to be vaccinated in order to get a public education. From looking on the internet and from the Mayo Clinic's website, 20,000 people a year are afflicted by this syndrome I have. Our lawmakers recently passed a law that allows vaccines to be mandated, yet the manufacturers have complete immunity of the side effects and damages caused by their vaccines. The fact that Dr. Richard Pan, a pediatrician from the University of California Davis Hospital located on Stockton Boulevard in Sacramento, California, who runs the pediatric training program there is an advocate of something that can cause this kind of damage or worse to children is incomprehensible. Not only does he not lack any moral character of any kind, but because this law is a primary fiscal benefit to the University of California who does the research and development of these vaccines and then gets paid to test these vaccines and then gets paid to administrate these vaccines. It's a complete cash cow for the university. They bought themselves a senator named Dr. Richard Pan 
who used to uh, be a community pediatrician whose philosophy at a time when I personally worked for this man as a volunteer for over seven years in the capacity of pediatric training. To have him become a tool and pawn of the university for the sake of generating billions and billions of dollars into the university, which is a direct benefit to the state of California and a direct benefit to the university and the largest contributor to Dr. Richard Pan's Senate campaign. It's all about the money, folks. And they've taken away your right, your obligation to look after your best interests in your family. And they don't mind 10, 20%, 15% of the population being taken out in one way or another through their bad vaccines. It's time for people to exercise their choice as an American to have the say over whether or not the government can inject a foreign substance into you without any repercussions at all is as most un-American and unpatriotic as anyone can be in my humble opinion. And again, when we look at the suffering of people who have had adverse reactions to vaccines, you have to ask yourself, do you want to play Russian roulette? Well, actually, Dr. Pan and those in California and others don't want you to have that choice. And of course, you're not going to know what your odds are in this game of Russian roulette that they force upon you. One man who did educate himself chose not to have his children vaccinated. And of course, this man was a former vaccine salesman working for Merck. Hello, uh, my name's Scott Cooper. I was a pharmaceutical rep for Merck Sharp and Dome, or Merck Human Health Company, as they became. I was a Vice President's Club Award winner in 1992, and um, I just wanted to share a story. My child was born in 91. He's now uh, going to be 24 this year. He was never vaccinated. He grew up very, very healthy, uh, rarely, if ever, sick, and always much healthier than his peers. When, uh, he was run when they were all running around, uh, all the kids had runny noses, drank a lot of milk, uh, were all vaccinated. Uh, my child was always healthy, uh, runny nose free, always, uh, always very, very healthy and smart. And uh, if I can digress a little bit, this was 1990, so the internet wasn't really available. I had read numerous books on vaccines. And like most people, I grew up believing in vaccines from what I was told in school. And it became a real shock to me when I started reading and learning that vaccines were not only ineffective, but also there were major risks involved with vaccination. So um, when I found out my wife was pregnant, I had a discussion with her about not vaccinating. And of course, she, had, uh, she was vac pro-vaccine. And so I made her a deal. At the time, I worked for a very large pharmaceutical company as a sales rep. And so I made her a promise. I said, I'll go to the library. I'll bring home everything I can find, pro-vaccine and anti-vaccine. And you can read for yourself, and then uh, you can make a decision. And so that's what I did. I went and scoured the periodicals in the libraries. I actually found a very small stack of information that was pro-vaccine, and yet I came home with boxes full of books and articles that were anti-vaccine. I just gave them to her and let her make up her own mind. And uh, I would come home from work and she would be reading the stuff and crying um, from what she was reading. And uh, so uh, by the time my child was born, we were both um, on the same page about uh, vaccination. And uh, it was interesting because I had my OBGYN or my wife's OBGYN sit me down in his office and say, look, you work for a large pharmaceutical company. What do you mean you're not vaccinating? And my company actually made a lot of the vaccines. And we had a vaccine division and everything else. And I told him, I told him flat out why. We, we went had a, a huge discussion about it. And while he didn't agree, he's, you know, we still went to the course that I wanted. During a, a, a training session with Merck, they brought in uh, their corporate attorneys. 
And I just happened to ask a question, uh, where do uh, most of our, our lawsuits come from and, and how large are they and, and so on. And uh, one, of the, one of the attorneys said flat out that most and almost all of our uh, lawsuits come from the vaccine division. What I'd like to say to people watching this video is to really do your own research, all right? If you're on the fence about vaccines or wondering at all, uh, whether to uh, vaccinate your child, please, please do your own research. There are a ton of resources available out there. Uh, Dr. Sherry Tenpenny, she has a, a site that is full of resources, thousands of pages of published uh, medical studies showing the inherent risks that are involved with vaccines. There are a ton of books out there showing this over and over again. The, uh, vaccine damage that is being done by these vaccinations. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 you, if you believe what you're told by the, uh, the AMA and the CDC and your doctor, you're not doing just, you're not doing enough research.